Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 10 of The Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui, and I'm here with Roger Pang. Good to see you. So we have just one follow-up from the last episode. So we were talking about uh, mentoring and managing and supervising employees, and I think one of the hot topics was time management, because I think it's a tra- it's a trap for me. I think it's a trap for many people. Yeah, and I think in the last episode, we, we kind of talked a little bit about um, – how students need to learn about time management. But we probably didn't give a lot of concrete tips, I think, as I no, recall. No, yeah. And part of the reason maybe because maybe we haven't figured it out right, either. Right. <laughs> yeah. But we, a listener emailed yes. and had a, ma- made a point that I think is actually very helpful, so I wanted to, to bring it up, and that is that um, oftentimes people can get into the trap of confusing the important things and the urgent things, or at least not prioritizing them correctly. Right. And so I think what can happen is, is someone needs a form filled out by a certain deadline, and those sort of things that feel more urgent are often not important. You know, the urgent ones have some external deadline attached to them, but the important things like getting a manuscript written, there's not an external deadline. And right. Th- so people spend their time, they get to work, and they do these things first that are perceived to be urgent. The end of the day arrives, and they haven't worked on their manuscript. And yes. so before you know it, you've put together days and days like that, where you felt like you've been working hard and been productive, but really what you've been doing is attending to unimportant things that have the perception of being urgent. Right. But on the other hand, you, know, you, you did fill out a lot of forms. <laughs> yes, that's true, but you, but that's not going to get you anywhere, right? Probably right? not. No. <laughs> and I use the form. I mean, in the in the school medicine world, oftentimes what that is is um, that uh, you know that there's charting and to be done. We mm-hmm. have electronic medical records now. There's a ton of documentation that needs to be done, and I'm not suggesting that people don't attend to that. But oftentimes people attend to that first thing in the day. And then the day gets away from them, and then they run out of time to write the manuscript or the grant or analyze data. And you know, completing your charting can be saved for the end of the day. Right. That's a, or even the next day, as right. long as it's not egregiously you know late. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Yeah. No. I've, there are a lot of things that also. I guess on top of that, I would say maybe that there are a lot of things that seem like they have deadlines, <laughs> but I later learned they didn't. Well, well not give, that they didn't have deadlines, but they did. They weren't exactly where I thought they were. So, give me an example of that. <laughs> That's a good question. I have one ready for you. Right, right. <laughs> As I said, well, because well, you're you're going to have to like divulge <laughs> I, something. I got to throw someone under the bus. Right. To do well, that, it could yeah. be. I actually, I'm going to throw myself under the bus. Mm-hmm. I and this maybe this is what you know gives me my closer reputation. Yeah. I will often give people deadlines that are earlier than the real deadline. Right, yeah. Particularly I, if I know that it's someone who has trouble meeting deadlines. Like me? <laughs> no, you, you meet your deadlines. Oh, do I? Okay. <laughs> so yeah. are those the fake deadlines you're talking about, the deadlines that that's, I send That's I one version. Okay. Yeah, that's one version, yeah. Um, I, I think the fact of the matter. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll weasel my way out of this by saying that like almost everything kind of falls into that category, with the exception of like you know like like a grant deadline right. or something like that, um, which is kind of hard to negotiate. But I bet you probably could if there were like extenuating circumstances. Right. Um, but for the most part, that's hard to negotiate. Right. But there aren't that many other things like that. So most deadlines, I would agree, you can negotiate. Yeah. But you don't want to get a reputation of the person who's always missing deadlines. No, you don't want to. Yes, you don't want to make it a habit. Right. <laughs> right. And there are people who get reputations for yeah. making it a habit. And yeah. Which is why I send out earlier deadlines than the real right. ones. But anyway. <laughs> well, okay, so here's the question. So you've adapted to those people. Right. Those people haven't had to do anything. So they're, they're fine. So I've been a terrible management of their manager of their behavior, right? Well. So what, what would you suggest? I mean, if you have a collaborator, for example, mm-hmm. that like never hits any deadlines, right? Um, the question is, well, what do you do about that, right? Well, it dep- and, <clears throat> right. So, okay. What do you, as right. like, the other person. Right. So one possibility is you adapt to it and you tell them the deadline's a week before it actually is. Right. Right. Um, are there other options? <laughs> you do their work for them. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, assuming that this person is absolutely essential. Right, right. Right. The other option is you can try to figure out how to alter their behavior. Uh-huh. But in my experience, that has not been so successful. <laughs> that I mean, is a be, losing yeah, strategy. Right? To yeah. be perfectly honest. Yeah, yeah. And... Um, you know, the one time, so the one strategy that could be helpful is that 
you know, a lot of times people are just overwhelmed and they're too busy. Mm -hmm. And so their response is they don't answer anything. Mm -hmm. And so one thing you can do is assume, you know, as much of the work as possible or find other people to do it. But then when you really need them, make it very, you know, clear that you need a deadline for sometimes you need to find the person's assistant yeah. and sort of help the, you know, assistant help you put pressure on that person. Yeah. So you can uh, be more, you know, if, you, if you're getting hundreds of emails a day in, in the people who are sending them are not helping you prioritize them. Now, right. they don't know what, who else is sending you emails, but for their own requests, they could help prioritize them in a way. Yeah. Actually, uh, so my, so my colleague Jeff Leake actually wrote a, a blog post way back when about how to get people to respond to your email. And, um, and it's true. Like, I think, you know, people uh, who are kind of at a certain level, they, like, we all get a ton of email. And it does help when, for example, you can respond to the email with a yes or no. Right. Right. And, um, or there's like a very specific, the very concrete thing that you can get, like you need to sign this form or whatever. Right. That's that's usually pretty easy to and, do. And I find myself respond, like if I get a long email that's several paragraphs long right. and it's not really clear what I need to do or I'm asked to think about a problem that's sort of diffuse and come <laughs> right. up with a solution, yeah. that that email is not easily attended to. So it gets flagged and put in my, you know, to-do box and... <laughs> Eventually, I do. How, how big is your to do box now? Well, I have stuff going back to 2010. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so what were we talking about? Yeah. yeah, how to get people to respond. Yeah, I to think, and I think the long term, you know, I think when you're in the thick of something and there's someone who, like, is never or is always late or whatever, mm -hmm. like, there's not much you can do about it. I think you either have to do the work for them or you have to kind of right. trick them into doing it, right, so to speak. Right. But the long term, I think, and then, but then, like, once that's done, it's probably best to think. Okay, this person was essential for this project, but you know, are they going to be essential moving forward? And how can I move? To, how can I pivot to like a strategy that doesn't require them? Right, and I think that's exactly right. Yeah. So if the person was essential and not kind of following through, then you that that's a huge problem. And and depending on the direction you're going into, you can either try to find someone else, or maybe they're so senior they have a more junior person that right. they're grooming who would actually be responsive. And right. so it does it, it it goes into your calculation about whether to continue to collaborate with them once the project is over. Yes, or on other projects. Right. right. Yeah. So I did want to mention one thing about um, how to get people to respond to emails. Uh -huh. The red envelope has the opposite effect on me. What's the red envelope? With like the exclamation point. That, <laughs> oh, because you use like Microsoft, the Outlook system? Yes, yes. yes. And so it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the person telling you it's urgent. Yes. That's and what, that's almost <laughs> invariably, the, those emails turn out to be the least urgent. <laughs> Well, they're, no, no, well, I would they're argue, urgent for the sender. Yeah, yeah, well, they're urgent, but they're not important. Yes. It's almost, it's a perfect indicator of not important. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> not important for you. I right. Say. I don't it's think I've ever sent person. an email with that flag on uh, it. No, I, I, yeah, I've never sent, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's all, it's, it's like, to me, it's like rather presumptuous, right? To say like, this is going to be important for you. Right. Right. <laughs> It's almost like someone's screaming at you because the envelope is red and there's this big red exclamation point right. after it in the Outlook system. And, right. You know. Okay. Good tip. Good tip. Yeah. So, do we any other time management? No. Although I did, I, I, I will mention that on Twitter, I had a little. Um, there was a thread between me and Brian Caffo uh, about be, about Professor Infinity. So. Which which is. So Professor Infinity, <laughs> is the opposite of Professor Zero. So I'll say. Professor Zero is the is the professor who says no to everything, or almost everything, and Professor Infinity is the flip side of that. Is the person who just says yes to everything, right? And then you know, and then commits, and then actually executes on some random subsample <laughs> of of everything. Of everything, yeah. <laughs> and do you think that you think everyone falls into one of those categories? Well. So you, you think the, it's dichotomous? <laughs> I think it's uh, it's strongly bimodal. So it comes from this. There's, a, there's an email strategy. It's called Inbox Zero. And so where the idea would be like every day, you make sure your inbox is clear. And it doesn't people, mean that you reply to every email. People do that? Oh, yeah. It's a whole, there's like a whole thing called Inbox Zero. Do you do that? No. Well, let me, so I'll get to that. But um, what Inbox Zero means is that, you know, you handle every email. You don't necessarily respond to it. So like if you, you might just like snooze this email till tomorrow. And so that's handled. And so at the end of the day, your inbox is clear. Um, 
And that's like a thing that you, it's all over the internet. And I've tried it once or twice, and I've always ended up at like inbox 15. Because <laughs> there's always 15 or so emails that just require a ton of thought or, or just going to take a while and you can't get past them. Right. And so I, I one time told someone that my strategy is inbox infinity, which is that I just, I just leave every email in my inbox. That's what I do. Yeah, exactly. I think most people, that's what they do. Right. Um, and, um, and once it like kind of scrolls off the bottom of the page, then it's, it's gone. Right. <laughs> right. And so you kind of deal with the stuff that's near the top of the inbox. Well, and, but, but um, there's also the flagging system. So it's both the top of the inbox and the flagged ones in my no, mind. No, but right? the flagging system is flawed because eventually the f- then your inbox becomes the flag right, right, emails, right? right. And, then, and then you'll have like flagging infinity. Right, no, and I right. do. Yeah. The, 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 I have something <laughs> right. flagged from 2010. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. And occasionally I'll search the flag box and I'll see these things from 2010, 2011, and right. I do try to unflag them at that moment, but then I'm like, okay, what's the, yeah. what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so inbox infinity is my email strategy, um, and so then professor infinity is just the natural generalization of that concept to everything that we do. Do you endorse one <laughs> strategy or the other? Uh, no, I think you just got to do wh- with you know whoever you are, whatever kind of person you are, you got to do whatever suits. And you are best. you a professor infinity or professor zero? <sighs> I don't know. See, I, I yeah. disagree with the whole idea that, that that everyone, that this is a dichotomous concept. Well, like most, like all dichotomies, it's not, it's not really a, truly a dichotomy, right? I mean, but. Um, it, well, I would say it's not even a bimodal distribution. You don't think it's, okay. No. So you think there's a strong center there where people are. Not necessarily a strong, just because it's not bimodal doesn't mean. In a, in, a, in a totally sane way. Oh, well, that's a charged sort of leading question, <laughs> yeah. right? No, I didn't say that. I just no, said not, I don't. No one is saying. Yeah. No one is saying. Yeah. Everyone's uh, yeah. A little I don't bit know. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but you're not. You're not like you can't answer that question because you don't fall into one of those categories. I mean, I think if I were to lean one way or the other, it's probably in the Professor Infinity direction. Mm-hmm. Which direction do you think? I don't even know where I fall. <laughs> you're. Uh, <laughs> you're. I don't know. Well, I think also I, as a kind of biostatistician, who's a lot of our job is collaborating with people. Um, you know, it's, I think we less often say no to collaborations right. or things like that just because it's the nature of our job. So I think if you're not a biostatistician, it's a different story. It's easier to be Professor Zero. Yeah. But it's bad to be either one. If you're Professor Zero. It's definitely bad to be in either extreme. Yes. yes. <laughs> the, the goal is to. The, be, the goal is to be like Professor Two. Right, right. Yeah, or, but, and then have those two things be important and meaningful for your own yes. career path. Yes. Right? Yeah. And figuring out what those are or predicting what those are going to be is hard. Yeah. All right. Anyway, that's that, that, that was that was not really useful advice at all. But no, it was I don't kind think, of more of a realization that I came to. Right. <laughs> so both of us have inbox infinity. Yes. And neither of us really knows whether we're Professor Zero or Professor Infinity. That's right. Although you believe that you lean more towards Professor Infinity. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now that we've got that settled. Yes. <laughs> so we were any other follow ups? Uh, no, I don't think so. So to move from entertainment to more entertainment we're mm-hmm. going to talk about wardrobes yes i'm looking forward to talking about are this. you yeah <laughs> so um and, and then we have another topic for the latter half of this episode yes and we're the wardrobe idea came up because i realized that we didn't really address it when we talked about gender in academia mm-hmm. and where are all the women professors and i've had lots of interesting conversations with my female colleagues about the uh, wardrobe challenges of, and that are ma- related in, in our conversations are specifically related to our gender and, and right. people's perception of you know whether we're really you know serious academics or yeah. um, or, or kind of legitimate and should be listened to. And, but then when I brought this up, you said that there were male wardrobe sort of conundrums as well. Well, I mean, I think it's different, obviously. But one of the things I think is so fascinating about this particular topic is that there are there are actually there are like so many dimensions it, on which to think of it like this the, in, ter- well, in, in terms of like what are the factors that explain the variation in wardrobe. Mm-hmm. And so, so gender is definitely one. There's like the position, like your rank. It is true, you know? like the higher up, the more likely people, and yeah. this is men really, yeah. to wear suits. 
Yeah. Right? We right. talked about being at a meeting where, you know, if you're in the dean's office right. or in a higher level office, you're Everyone's sitting wearing in the meeting. A suit. Yeah. Right, right. There's like an East Coast, West Coast thing. Oh, that's There's true. a medical, non medical. Yes. There is like American, US versus Europe uh-huh. versus Asia versus other places in the world. There's, anyway, so I think there's lots of like ex- explanatory predictors that are kind of interesting to think about. So, what do you, so where, which of those do you want to start with? So you're so you. Well, I could talk about like my evolution. Here, okay. Well, the, what, so you're wearing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we could talk about what we're wearing, we're wearing right now. Yeah. And that's the the uh, downside of a podcast is that there's no image. That's right. Right. But you, so you're wearing jeans. I'm wearing jeans and like a short sleeve button up button shirt. Down shirt. Yes. Well, like it. That has a collar. That has it has a collar. Yes. There's no tie. Definitely no tie. No tie. Yes. I don't think I've ever seen you in a tie. Probably not. Yeah. And I'm wearing sneakers. And then you will pull out like the, the, the corduroy or tweed jacket, <laughs> right? To throw on, but no tie if, if you have some sort of yeah, university. So, so, so I think my academic formal wear is like non jeans pants. <laughs> but, but, but what is formal wear for? Like, oh, what, yeah, oh like, good question. Right. So <laughs> it's, it's interesting because um, uh, the, the, the scope for formal wear has grown as I've kind of increased and uh, gone up the ranks the, the, the standard deviation no no, no, no i mean like the, the the situations in which it applies oh uh, because have it, grown not because it's be, it's because you're having more opportunities for where it's not that your perception of what you should wear at the same event has changed it's that you're being invited to events that require more events that require formal wear both 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 okay. yeah so for example you know it would you know often i would go to if i were to go to like a conference uh, to give a talk, mm-hmm. like a you know a generic, field specific conference, to give a talk, I might wear, you know, like khakis and like a long sleeve shirt, or maybe not even a long sleeve shirt, a, bu- a button down collared yeah. shirt. Okay. Uh, whereas now, like to that same meeting to do the same thing, mm-hmm. I might wear a jacket. And why is that? I have no idea. Because the further <laughs> that you get up in rank, like the... you think it would go in the other direction, right. right? Like I think this is just something about my psychology that like I feel the need to do this. So like I just went to a meeting last week. Uh, and um, I've been to this kind of meeting many times. It was a smaller one. And uh, for some reason, like, I was like, oh, I should probably wear a jacket to this meeting. And um, there was really no reason to do that. I, I mean, it's not like anyone did asked, you, no one did cared. Did you feel more sort of empowered or important or? <laughs> I think that's part of it. Like, I think I feel like, I don't know, for some reason it allows me to talk to people in a certain way. I don't, so it yeah. legitimizes you. Yeah, because, you know, I'm not legitimized. So next time, what you need to do is come in with, like, a pipe. Yeah, with, like, patches with the prof- on the elbow. Yeah. 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 And Yeah. Anyways, but, but that's the limit, though. Like, I, I almost, I can't even remember the last time I wore a tie for work-related reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, it was probably, it, the last time I did that was probably because, like, I was going to be, like, on like recorded or you know or video or something like right, that, right? You know. But um, but not many people in my department, you know, almost nobody wears a tie. But I think that's different in other in other places, right? So um, but yeah, but a jacket is definitely within the realm of possibility. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that's the that's the formal wear. The formal wear, and I usually I'll I'll nowadays I will wear it to meetings, uh, like like conferences, mm-hmm. I guess is what I mean, and then. Uh, I can't think of a recent scenario otherwise other than that. So do you just have two, like there's formal and informal at work and that's it? Well, there's kind we're, of... We're back to the binary world. <laughs> no, well, I would never wear a jacket just like to the office. Right. Uh, so then it's just like, then okay, so then the dichotomy is teaching versus not. Oh. Yes, because huh. obviously we don't do, cl- you know, clinical service, right. for example. But cl- our teaching is kind of, in some sense, the analog mm-hmm. where we're like in front of Clients, clients are outside right, people, right, right? But but the clients you're in front of are typically twenty somethings. I mean, not yes. across the board. There there yes. are older They're students here too, college but, graduates right. or recent, relatively recent right, college right. graduates. Yeah. So, but I do feel compelled to dress up. Why? Or a little bit. You so there's no part of you that wants to be kind of a little bit um, provocative in your no, and I'm not. I'm like it's not like a general scenario. Like there's other people in the school. Like you don't want to be that. Who wear prof- like shorts to go teach their class. Right, that's yes. what I'm saying. Or yeah. be the professor who has a bunch of piercings and tattoos and a blue mohawk. Or well, I don't think that has anything to do with 
That's more of a personal. That's thing. what I'm saying. Yeah. So, but that you don't gravitate towards. No, I'm not that kind of person. Right. Yes, in general. Um, but but on the other hand, so this is why the, like the medical non medical is a big divide. Like if you're, I feel like if you're on an arts and science campus, uh, and which is where I came from. So I went, I got my PhD at a stat department. Uh, which is like an arts and science type of department. It's like very close to the math department. And um, sure. there, there's like, there's no rules. <laughs> as far as I can tell, like you show up in shorts and a t-shirt, teach class. No, Pe- people are happy you're dressed. People are happy that you've got clothes on at yes. all. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's a very different world, very different feel. And like you'd be in sandals and, you know, and it's totally fine. Especially, especially in like Los Angeles is where I went to grad school where it's like always warm. Right. And, you know, so... Um, so that world is like so. And then I remember when I came here to interview, I thought, "Wow, it's really formal here." Cause wow, because pe- people are like wearing like pants and like right. long sleeve shirts, you know, right. and they're tucked in. <laughs> <laughs> so I really felt like no, I really felt like it was formal. And I think that was both an East Coast West Coast shift and a medical non medical shift. Right, yeah. right. So I just I do feel like on the on most medical campuses, people are just a little bit more. It may be well, and people up, here because the school of public health is on the medical campus and the school of medicine. Yeah. But there's a difference in how even researchers from the School of Medicine dress. Like I would say, even though it's hard to like equate level of formality between men's and women's clothes, yeah, I'm pr- probably because I'm not in jeans. Like I don't ever wear jeans to work, right? right? Yeah. Whereas you wear jeans to work. So even when I'm serving in a research capacity, right, I'm probably like one hair more dressed up than you are. Yes. Even when I'm not, it's not my clinic day yes. and I'm not seeing patients. I think this is a general, there's an average shift. Right. Uh, in terms, Across uh, in general, the street. Yeah, that you're just more dressed up on average than I am. Right. Yeah. So why is that? Why is that? So I think it's the medicine, non-medicine part. Like even though you're on the medical campus and being in the School of Public Health, mm-hmm. um, I think that for many people who are in the School of Medicine, they may not have one dedicated day when they see they see patients. Right. So they may be called to see patients at any point in time. And so men are typically often in ties. Mm-hmm. Um, is that, is that it, traditional for when you're seeing patients? It is. Okay. It's, it's becoming a little bit less that way. Um, certainly if you go out into like a practice setting, mm-hmm. a lot of times um, – Physicians, the male physicians are not in mm-hmm. ties, or less so, and then especially on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. So I think part of it is being on the East Coast, and part of it is, you know, Hopkins is a pretty traditional institution mm-hmm. on top of that. Yeah. Um, so I think there's that layer of things, but I think there's, you know, so, so there are all the layers you talked about. But for me, the interesting thing about being female in, in wardrobe, and I think you've been there when you've heard you know, me talk to some of our my female colleagues about yeah. attire and yeah. how to kind of, it, it, there's this challenge of sort of balancing kind of, um, so we all, we are, we're in this interesting role, the, my colleagues, because we see patients clinically, um, but we also do research, but we do more clinical research. And there's this sense that if you're a laboratory scientist, Oftentimes you're much less dressed up because you're not seeing patients. Yeah. And if you, and that a lot of, there's this worry that how do I get taken seriously by the scientific community? So depending on who you're going to interact with. Right. And can you be taken seriously by the scientific community if you're wearing, you know, uh, high heels, you know, and... Um, a tight skirt or, you know, snug fitting skirt, et cetera? Or do you need to, you know, project this kind of sense that you're less concerned about your appearance and fashion and wardrobe because even though that absolutely should have nothing to do with how good of a scientist or how, you know, smart or accomplished you are, I think women are very sensitive to the fact that people pick up on how we're dressed. Yeah. And so we worry, at least, you know, I worry and the colleagues, that, female colleagues I've talked to worry a little bit about how we present ourselves. And mm. am, am I seeming like I, my wardrobe matters and my physical appearance matters too much to me in this environment where I want to sort of project the sense of, you know, you should really take me seriously because mm. I'm a, I'm a worried that they're going to take me less seriously if I've not dressed that way or um, and then all the way to the other end you know am I going to be you know not pulled together enough kind of right (laughs) like you know so so I think there's this constant kind of back and forth about well what's the appropriate 
attire that I should should have on. And, and it all, I think, is related to being sensitive about how people perceive women's attire and the assumptions that they make about, you know, how seriously to take that person in terms, professionally, in terms of their, yeah. you know, career achievements. Right. And, yeah. I think, be, I mean... One thing that uh, can I, that I remember now is that when I when I, when I first got here, uh, I was pretty young. I mean, I think when I got here, I was like twenty six, uh, and um, and so you know when I was when I when I would teach class, like part of my concern was like I want them to at least know that I'm the person who's teaching the class, you know. <laughs> and at that time, you know, a lot of the students were actually older than I was, right? You know, especially like the you know we have people from the medical school who come and right. Do that, I was in my you were one of those people, yeah. not for me, but right, right. And so, and they're obviously dressed up, right? Because they like, oh, they just got out of surgery or whatever. <laughs> they seem like that's a, that's a stereotype yeah. that you have of us. Yeah. It's really not that glamorous. Yeah. Anyway, but they they tend to be more dressed up. They're coming in and whatever, and uh, and uh, and so I kind of felt the need to like, oh, I probably should dress up when I'm teaching, so at least people know that I like I'm the guy who teaches the right. class. Right. Right. And so there was a little bit of that. Whereas, like, I think if you taught on an undergraduate campus. Um, you know, the undergrads are not coming in with jackets and ties right. for the most part. So, but it's the um, same concept where you, whether it's fair or appropriate or not, people do, you know, you do think about the message that you're sending with your attire. And so you. Right. I do. You know, I definitely think about it in terms of like, I feel like I need, you know, I, if I'm the person teaching the class, like I need to exhibit some sort of like a thought, like an authority right. figure kind of look. Right. Right. Um, and so trying to be a female where. The, the word authority and female, those things together are very fraught. Mm-hmm. You know, how is it that, so what we struggle with is how do we dress, you know, in a, in a way that feels natural mm-hmm. to us. Right. And I'm not speaking for all women, right. just because before we get angry <laughs> emails, but these are conversations I've had with my female colleagues, but in a way that also does, works to help us sort of, you know, garner respect and doesn't hurt our ability to kind of garner professional respect. Yeah. And do you think you do you think about that more or less now as opposed to earlier in your career? It depends on the venue. Yeah. Well, the venues have changed now, right? Right. So you're, right. you're in different venues now. Right. That's part of the issue. Right. So I think about it less at our annual professional society meeting because mm-hmm. I'm so I have an established reputation there. Right. Um, I, I don't think that my natural way to dress, fortunately, is either, you know, I, I don't like wearing high heels because I can barely walk in them anymore. <laughs> okay. You know, I, so I don't I don't feel I don't like, either, yeah. yeah, you don't yeah, either. Yeah. I, I don't feel like I'm having to to sort of put a lot of extra thought or constraints in terms of how I dress because I don't gravitate towards kind of one more extreme or the other. And then I have kind of an established professional identity within that community but I think it's very different if I'm going to a meeting with uh, health system people right who are executive level level health system people right and for that crowd those are mostly business people right. who maybe understand a little bit about academics you know in, in medicine mm-hmm. but that's not really their world and so I'm gonna try to be more polished in my right. appearance and that <laughs> You know, yeah. circumstance, but you know, there's also the reality of, you know, getting up at the crack of dawn and realizing that you know I'm wearing one black shoe and one blue shoe after I've been at work, <laughs> right. right? Like yeah. these these things happen For to sure. us. They may yeah. and may happen to men yeah. too. So it's not like a, it's not like I have time to like, you know, it's it, it sounds like I'm thinking a lot more about it, right? <laughs> actually, I'm spending yeah. more time. So it's there, it's something in the background. And for certain kind of venues or meetings, I'll think about it a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and, and I think another thing is, and maybe this will get laughs out of people is, um, and this probably shows my age, like, do you have, so from a clinical standpoint, you're not supposed to have open-toed shoes. Okay. And the style in women's shoes is, a lot of them are open-toed. Yeah. So... Uh, do you have red nail polish on your toenails or not? You know, when you have okay. open-toed shoes, and <laughs> does that? What kind of message does that send to someone who is a collaborator, who's maybe a basic scientist, right? Who's walking in in sandals every day, and you know, is is used to kind of a different culture of. of are you saying that this is something you might think about? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I, those are things that I think okay. about, it, yeah. depending on like like I said, I'm not worried about it here because yeah. I, I know we have a we're do, podcasting an episode and right. like I know who I'm going to interact with and right. 
Um, but I might think about it if I went to go meet with the dean or the provost right. or something. Well, I think so. I think on average, I think I actually think about clothing more than I used to because because like I'm more likely to be meeting with the dean or the provost right. or whatever. Whereas like when I was a first year assistant professor, there's no chance that would have happened. And I think um, so. And also part of it, I think, is just my. You know, like you gotta act like a grown up now. <laughs> Whereas, like when I was fresh out of grad school, I still I was still clinging on to that. You know, I'm still a grad student uh, sense. You know, so you get promoted to full professor, and you suddenly realize you have to act like a grown up. Yeah, it, it's it's only been a couple months, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still getting used to the feeling. Um, so do you think a sign of your career success will be when I I start noticing that you're wearing suits at work? No, I was thinking, um, no, maybe the opposite. Like okay. when I start coming in with like shorts and a t-shirt, okay. then you know that I'm like. You're in a good place. I'm in a good place, right, yeah. Um, um, so I mean, <laughs> I, I, I think, yeah, so I think my, my consciousness about wardrobe has definitely increased over time. Um, because of the, and, uh, so I'll, I mean, I can really one. So one story. I have a friend who I can tell you after we're done recording, um, who you know worked, got a, you know started working in the dean's office one day, and uh, he kind of went in dressed as, as he was always dressed, you know, and um, and at some point the dean came to him and said, "Don't ever dress like that again in here." Wow. And uh, and then from there on it was suits, it was jackets and ties. I, I imagine this sort of like. YouTube video where he walks into a revolving door into the dean's office in, sh in shorts and sandals, yeah. and then when he comes out at the end of the day, he's like, <laughs> "It's like, it's like, uh, yeah, it's like he's been it's assimilated into the yes, Borg." Or, yes. Yeah, and uh, well, and well, and the logic there, of course, is that like you know, people in the dean's office, you know, they could be meeting with donors at any time. Right. They could be meeting with uh, other you know, executives, things like that, and you know, you you want to be you know, looking like whatever it is you right. need to look like when you meet with donors. And what's interesting about that is had your friend been female, mm -hmm. what could the dean have said? Really, right? Like that starts to get, you know, it's yeah. interesting because the, if the dean is male and your friend is male, yeah. it makes it much easier for the dean to say something right. because it's more clear what kind of appropriate attire might be. There's no question about like, why are you noticing my attire and right. you know, telling me what's appropriate or not appropriate. Right. And, so uh, anyway, so I think it's, um, you know, it's certainly, I think as you get into administrative type positions, the uh, there's a bit of a more of a, I guess, I would, I would say a, a, perhaps a standard. Right. Um. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an unwritten standard. For sure it's unwritten, yes, yes, yes. yes. And it's often not explicitly spoken mm -hmm. either. Yeah. So there's one other mm -hmm. wardrobe thing that I wanted to mention, and that is there's kind of this also devil may care kind of I'm a badass scientist kind of wardrobe that uh -huh. I think. What does that look like? I think it could take all you know shapes and forms. Okay. Like I've heard stories of people coming in to give a talk and they've taken their shoes off. Yes. Right and yes. giving a talk like that, so that's sort of a you know I'm so good at what I do but that, I, that no, I don't even need to worry. I don't about. need to worry about wearing shoes. Yeah. Another story that I've heard is um, my husband was at a small you know laboratory based science meeting and it was like an aspen or something, mm -hmm. and the person literally skied off the slope into the meeting venue like took his skis off like right outside and walked in like in ski boots in the whole ski attire like put his goggles of, you know yeah, put his right. goggles up on the his head or his helmet went to the podium <laughs> just started and talking gave his talk <laughs> you know so it takes some kind of some serious ego to kind of feel that way and it does you know I'm not saying this is a good message but yeah. it sort of is like I'm at this meeting, we're meant to ski, you know, you're paying to hear me speak for 45 minutes about my amazing research and... Here it is. Here it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean... And then I'm going to go back and get on the lift yeah. and go skiing again. <laughs> well, that's the person who's very efficient about their schedule, yes. you know? <laughs> yeah. But I think there is a little bit of, there, there's also that, there is a little bit of like, you know, I'm a badass scientist. And, yes. Um, so I can be unconventional in my attire, whether it be not having shoes or wearing yes. full-on ski gear yeah. while you're giving a talk. In fact, actually, it's funny you may, you say that because um, a while back there I was there I remember hearing a conversation about uh, a woman who was going to give a talk about her research um, to some 
kind of fancy, like a fancy crowd. It was like an event at the uh-huh. school. Uh, and, um, and she was asking, like, you know, what should she wear? And um, this was going to be like an evening event. It's going to be like, a, you know, one of these kind of like donor type things. Right. And, um, and who was she? What was, who were the people she was asking? Uh, like, uh, you know, like faculty, or like faculty kind of mentors. Colleagues yeah. or mentors. No, no. This, so this person was like a very junior person. Mm-hmm. And, and so one person was like, well, you should dress up, you know, because it's a nice event. And, and was she asking males or females? Both. Because that's interesting. Both. And uh, that's not relevant. I don't think oh. it's not relevant to the story. But the, to my, the point that I'm trying to make of oh, the story, sorry. which is that, like, so some people said, you know, it's a formal event. You should dress like a formal, you know, like you would in a mm-hmm. formal event. Um, and another person said, no, 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 no. You, you, you want to go in there looking like in like in wearing whatever right because then because then it's like because you're like this badass scientist you know and you're talking about your laboratory you know work i can't remember what it was but it was something i think it was laboratory you're based. above all yeah. of this dress and it's code. like you don't care about all that stuff all you care about is this like awesome science that you do you gotta walk in there with just like whatever and that so that's what one person said to her right and uh, i don't know what ended up happening at the end because i didn't actually i wasn't invited to this thing so but um but you know so there is that there's definitely that not only is there that sense but there's like an explicit sometimes like you know, uh, that's amazing that someone right yeah. explicitly advised her to do that because yeah. I've, I've just sort of observed that happening, but hadn't heard people talking about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so what is your wardrobe advice for people then? Like, it, it, it depends on the, what do you mean. So, like, so like a junior uh, postdoc or junior faculty. <laughs> well, I, I think, like I said in the beginning, it, there's all these factors, right? Right, and I think what, but so it, it's I don't know. It's, is there okay? So the question is whether there is general advice and like whether right. and whether it matters. Right. Um, Does it I matter? Think, I think if you're an assistant professor, probably not. And I, I and, I'll, and I'll, err, I'll err on I'll just caveat that with you know if you're in the non kind of clinical domain, uh, I think if you're like a, you're coming in as an assistant professor, um, it for the most part doesn't matter. I think. Um, now I think there are like there are there are also like cultural norms I think like so for example I like one time I, I don't often go to international meetings, but like one time I went to a meeting in Germany, and everyone's in jackets and ties. All the men are in jackets and ties, mm. and this is very unusual for me, you know. And but that's I think there's like a different cultural right. uh, thing there. Right. So um, I think the advice is is there are cultural norms yeah. for. You know, whatever your group or your environment or your department or your school is, yeah. And by all, well, yeah. By all means, if you don't want to adhere to those, don't adhere to them. Mm-hmm. But I do think that it would be naive to pretend like what you choose to wear may not influence people's perceptions of you. Right. And and that you just want to think about that. And yeah. I think there's also a difference between what you wear day to day at work versus what you wear if you're giving a presentation and what the cult, you know cultural norms are right. at, at that particular meeting. Yeah. I don't um, know, would you agree with that general <laughs> advice? I guess so. I mean, I get maybe another way to ask this question is kind of like I mean, how much time, how much percentage of your brain power should be dedicated oh, to very about this problem? Right. Yeah, very right. little. Very yeah. little. But mean, yet we're very we're, little at, almost at all times, right? Yes. Of your career. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, but, but you should stop from time to time. Shouldn't be zero. It should not be zero. It should not be zero. I've had, you know, I've had wardrobe malfunctions, <laughs> right? And and I know many of my colleagues who've had wardrobe malfunctions. It's also a little bit more complicated just because for women, generally speaking, our choices and like degree of right, you guys have categorical options. For attire, that's right. We and, have and the number of categories is small, right? Yeah. We have ours is basically continuous it's infinity, yeah. And not only that, <laughs> the number of com- it's like a multivariable model. Yeah, our attire every yeah. day because there's like, what footwear are you going to wear? What you know? Right. Anyway, it's more it, like one of the it's one of those like GRE logic puzzles. Yeah, you know, it's like a, Susie can't sit next to Amy because Amy <laughs> yes. doesn't like George. And right, you know, yes, like, <laughs> yes. That's that's oftentimes that like our wardrobes they don't have to be that complicated. But they, <laughs> so by default, you know, if I'm putting shoes on, I may say, hmm, you know, I I don't want to wear these heels because I'm gonna be running around on you know seeing patients right. all across the hospital. I shouldn't wear them or. These shoes are really beat up, and I have a you know meeting with you know executive level people, right. so I really shouldn't wear 
these shoes that are falling apart <laughs> right. or uh, so, so just that that momentary thought uh-huh. and probably in the end none of this matters you know well, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I, but I'm just telling you sort of what my kind of thought process but I do know that the women I've talked to who are my colleagues have we have the same we all have very similar yeah. sort of thoughts about this so maybe the bottom line is that it really doesn't matter except maybe a little yes <laughs> All right, that's useful advice, right. I can and tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the, 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 um, if, you, if you don't like dressing up, like the ideal place would be like Southern California in a math department. Oh, wow. <laughs> then you You're set. anything You're goes. Set. Yes, yeah. And the other, end, what, the other end of that spectrum would probably be, I don't know. I don't know where it would be because it would be some place where you would wear like if you were a, a man a suit really? every day and a yeah. woman the kind of equivalent. Yeah, like an but, East Coast hospital. Right, basically. right, <laughs> right. The other tip is is like if you if you find an outfit that sort of maybe is not full on suit mm-hmm. but is more professional than what you know like I might wear every day, it's nice to just always have that and mm-hmm. then it's a no brainer because you can just whip it out on those days when yeah, you know right. it's funny you mentioned that. i actually had a i'll say a colleague who uh who had like a suit crumpled in his like the drawer well, that, i'm not sure having it crumpled <laughs> yeah. is so effective but. well it didn't matter because it's like he was in a place where like that was never needed oh <laughs> which was probably why it was crumpled in yeah. his desk yeah but yeah but um it, yeah it never hurts it could it could be a useful strategy right. to- so something that's common in the school of medicine is um men will often have a tie, mm-hmm. a few ties in their office. Right. So that if suddenly they get called and they have to go see a patient or something, they'll put the tie on. Yeah. Uh, that probably doesn't happen over here in the school of public well, health. Well, there's not, there's not much that's kind of unexpected. Well, that's what, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. uh, it's like you're also going to get called to teach a class or something like that. Right. Um, and even if you were, it's, it's, it's not you like you're considered like... unprofessional if you're not wearing a tie. Yes. Yeah. So... I think the, old, the the worst case scenario would be like, oh, Michael Bloomberg is here, and we want you to talk to him. Right, right. right. <laughs> then I would feel a little uncomfortable if I were. Right. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, is there, I guess is there anything else about clothes? I, th- I think that's it. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see what the f- interest and feedback is on the wardrobe <laughs> discussion. Yeah. So we've paired the wardrobe discussion with something that's actually a, a much meatier topic. We're going from one extreme to the other. I thought that was an interesting topic. It is an interesting. Yeah. What we didn't talk about was hairstyle and the wardrobe part oh, of it, but I'm not yeah. sure we want to go there. Not, not. No. It's a little bit much for it's one a bit episode. Much. Yeah. So uh, the the meteor topic is about um, sort of. So if you are, tr- are training, so you're getting a PhD, or you are an MD in a fellowship program, and so you're learning, you know, you're getting research training as a part of that. You're in an environment and in a culture appropriately that's e- expecting you to go on into academia, and the, and and there are also cultural norms that are often, um, I, in my mind, they're linked to what's considered prestigious, mm-hmm. right? So just like, you know, if you are a certain type of athlete, there's certain things that are prestigious within that type of, you know athletic endeavor or sport, you know, that you participate in this particular marathon or qualified for that, or you're, you know, wearing, speaking of wardrobe, you know, these kinds of whatever athletic attire. Mm -hmm. So everything has cultural trappings and academia has cultural trappings too. And part of it is, is the institutional or the, the mission of the academy is to train people to go on and work in academia, right, um, and and within academia, there are things that are considered prestigious, and so we wanted to talk a little bit about um, what it feels like if you're training in that environment, and maybe um, how being in that kind of culture and and being surrounded by a certain norm about what's prestigious or expected, you know, can influence you know, trying to learn how to do research and become an independent researcher or figure out what you want to do long term for your career. Mm-hmm. I think, did I describe that well enough? It's a little well, complicated. It, it might be useful to maybe lead off with like just a, a simple example. A simple of ex- So I think this happens at all different stages. But one of a, a great example that we have is we have an NIH training grant, a T32. And the expectation 
is for the clinical fellows who are on this training grant that they are going to go on and have careers in academia. So they're not going to go into practice and see patients. Mm -hmm. Um, And that can be challenging because people at the time of coming to fellowship, there are a couple of cultural aspects. They often pick allergy immunology or whatever field they pick because they're interested in that kind of general health condition. Mm -hmm. But they don't necessarily, they're not, they don't have a research question, you know, that they're a problem that they kind of want to focus on typically. Right. So they get into fellowship and they may start wondering whether they really want to pursue a career in academia or not. Once, Yet, they, once they learn what it means to do it, research. Exactly. Yes. Right. And but the survival of our training grant is based on the proportion of people, largely the proportion of trainees we send into academia. Mm-hmm. And so if being a mentor, I'm in conflict, right? Because I I have some duty and allegiance to our training grant and our Your department and the whole program. Yeah. And on a like population basis, I do think that, you know, if you're being supported by the government to train in this program and we tell everyone up front the expectation is is you want to do research, that by and large almost everyone should go and do this. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, the job of a good mentor is to help the individual figure out what exactly it is that that is a good match for them in terms of career goals, mm-hmm. even if it is not for them to go into academia. Yeah. And that's an example of uh, a, a, a situation, an environment that w- where you the fellows get messages and they're inundated with messages about, well, of course you're going into academia and of course you're going to do research. and. That. And they, and so that's e- it's easily interpreted as that that's kind of the better or right. more prestigious thing to do. Right, right. Yeah. And so I think there are many examples of that. But like I would, what are some examples? Well, so I think that's a that's a good example for kind of in the early stage, mm-hmm. uh, and then in the, I think in the later stage, you know, I think one of the things is a lot of pressure to do, um, generally speaking, is to grow. Um, to uh, whether you've got uh, you know a big lab, um, lots of students. Lots of postdocs, lots of st- research staff working for you, uh, lots of grants, lots of money. But before um, even that, I yeah. think there's pressure, and this may be less true here in the School of Public Health. In the School of Medicine, you can join the faculty, and your stated mission may be yes, I do want to do some research, but I've really been hired to see patients and be an educator. Mm-hmm. There's pressure from the system to not do that. Like the, there's a cultural perception that that is quote unquote, less than someone who says, I'm going to do be an 80, 20, you know, physician investigator, where I spend 80% of my time doing research and have independent funding and a small percent of my time doing clinical work. So that's the first step. And then the step beyond that is, Uh is like, how big is your lab? Even amongst people who have all kind of decided that they just want to do research, then it's still like, there's a pressure to grow uh, and, uh, and to kind of do more and get more. Uh, more resources, right. that is. Um, and so, um, th- and that's kind of a, that's a powerful kind of cultural force, I think. Um, and so, yeah, and so this is another example of kind of uh, what is, I think what is considered more, in some sense, more prestigious right. than others. And there's also the same thing about then the institution where you are. Mm-hmm. So in other words, um, if you're looking at a job or you're say you're from XYZ institution, you know, there's certain institutions that are considered more prestigious. And right. so, you know, people <clears throat> make an assumption, which I think is can, is an erroneous assumption, that because you are a faculty member at X, Y, or Z, you must be extraordinarily more talented than a faculty member, you know, at another institution. Right. Um, and you know, that's not the case. But I think that all these pressures sort of can build up, right? And and the system likes having those pressures because it reinforces, it's like a positive feedback loop, right? So if you can go get a, a faculty position at the most prestigious place, that place oftentimes pays much lower salaries and it's much harder to get promoted. Mm-hmm. You know, so it feeds on itself. And, right, yeah. Um, so I think all of these are positive kind of feedback loops. And it's never good for academia to lose more people to uh, career paths outside of academia. Mm-hmm. And it's never good in terms of the institution 
to be um, a um, be in the position of you know having a smaller pool of people who want to work at your institution. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so, the yeah. More, so you know the more that you can. Uh, tout your ranking in whatever the top schools of medicine or the top schools of public health right. and the more competitive and prestigious it seems the you know the better it is for the institution but that may be promoting kind of uh, stereotypes or people make assumptions that are not correct that may hurt them yeah. in their career choices so 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 why are we talking about this? So, so one issue that I think a, a, down, a real world issue that comes up, like you mentioned this already, is like you have a trainee, a student, whatever it may be, um, and um, you know they're they're thinking about, and, and we've talked about this before actually, uh, about you know not pursuing an academic career or not pursuing a kind of bread and butter academic career, um, uh, like a tenure track position or whatever it may be. Uh, so then, what do you do as the mentor? Um, with um, how do you advise that person? What do you tell them? Right. I think it's tough because I think there's a fine line to walk between being overly sensitive to the fact that there's a culture that um, sends messages constantly about the importance of pursuing an academic career mm-hmm. path um, and worrying that the, the trainee is going to feel too much pressure. So the minute they say, you know, I'm not really sure I want to do this, I think you want to avoid sort of jumping onto that and saying, oh, yes, go do something else, right, right? right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's tricky, but I think you want to be open to those sort of signals um, from the mentee. Mm-hmm. Um, and the hope is that you have a good enough relationship with them that they um, will tell you what their true kind of career aspirations are or that if they're struggling with that decision because they're all going to str- like we all struggle with these things at different stages of our career so yeah. it's normal at that stage of your career to start thinking about well which path do I really want to take and does this make sense i think ultimately your job as a mentor is to help them think through all of that yeah and the metric by which you sort out whether your training grant is successful or not is not whether 100% of people go into academia. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe the, the the benchmark is whether three quarters of people go into academia. And mm-hmm. so I think there is a, pl- a, a sweet spot where you can find where your training program is still very successful, mm-hmm. but you can hopefully thread that needle and also, you know, be a good mentor and advocate for someone who kind of has figured out, well, maybe this isn't the right career path for yeah, me yeah so now you're in academia you're a tenure track professor you're like let's say you're an associate professor this is where things tend to happen really <laughs> well in terms of the pressure i think the you know i think if you're lucky no one's going to bother you when you're an assistant professor you gotta like get your research done and um now you're an associate professor you're like you're in the most vulnerable, at least here you are. In some places you're tenured, right? Um, but here you're not. Because yeah. this is a prestigious institution, so it's harder to get tenure, exactly right? Exactly right, yes. We withhold all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so it's kind of a, it's a tough spot because you're kind of senior enough to do things that require senior people, but you're not senior enough to be tenured. <laughs> so um, the school kind of, I don't know, you kind of, there's almost a sense in which this whole university kind of runs on associate professors. Um, so now you're going to get asked to be the director of the training program. You're going to ask to uh, go for these big center grants, or you're going to be asked to, um, you know, to take on new uh, things that are, I think many people perceive as that's like the natural um, progression of a successful academic career. So those things are perceived as prestigious. Yeah, a that they're prestigious if you're the director of whatever, and b um, they will help you eventually get tenure. Uh huh. Um, so now ha- what? How do you handle that? <laughs> well, so it's I think a little bit different in the school of medicine. So there's so there's an inherent tension between what the institution or your department needs and wants and what's best for you. Mm-hmm. So I fully believe that the one factor that is important to understand is that you, know, you ultimately are promoted on the strength of kind of your, your body of, of scholarly work, so your research in this circumstance. So what, how many papers have you published? Have you had senior kind of roles in those publications? Have they 
been kind of followed along a theme and been impactful in a field? Do you have independent funding? Do you have a track record of independent funding? And I think all of the other stuff, if you take care of that, is window dressing. Mm-hmm. And I think oftentimes people aren't told that. Now, that, that doesn't mean that there's no well, duty. Who's, or- who's going to tell them that? Right. I just told them that. Well, you may be the only one. I'm the only. No one ever told you that. <laughs> well, if you think about it, it's like there's no there's no one who's incentivized to tell you well, that. Well, I guess you know we were talking about this earlier. I think my the division chief who hired me told me this. Okay. Okay. And he actually, I now am recalling, I had a conversation with him, and he said, "It's a." Am- he said to me, "It's amazing to me that people don't understand the rules." Because the rules are now he, he's retired now, so these are the traditional rules. Is the entire currency of the academic system is based on publications and grants. Right. End yeah. of story. And he said, "And you get the rules, so you are going to just be just fine." Yeah. Well, I think uh, I think it for the most part still is the rule. Right. Um, but so no one, you you think no one. No one talks about that, really. Well, no one comes out so clearly and says it like that. Because you know? it's too crass? or uh, I... Well, you know, I think so. I think um, I think because people don't want to give the impression like there's a formula, you know, for getting from, for getting promoted. Um, and why are people uncomfortable with the formula? Uh, I, that's a good question. I, <laughs> I, I asked the very, biostatistician. It feels very reductive. You know, it feels like, you know... If A, then B, right? Right. <laughs> it feels and so. It feels like at a kind of ta- in some way, it kind of takes away from the glamour of the profession. Really? I, I don't. I don't right. necessarily think so. But I, I also think that you know, I think there's not an incentive if you're like the department chair or a, associate dean or you know whatever it is, you're in some administrative position. It's not really like in your interest to say, don't worry about all this stuff that I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or you know, don't worry about all this other stuff. Even though I'm going to ask you to be doing those things, like in a couple right, of years, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, that's what I meant. That's what I meant when I said like, there's no one there to tell you that, right? Because the senior people or the people who you might look up to uh, are not necessarily incentivized to tell you that, and the people who are kind of on your level uh, may not un- either know, understand, or um, or believe it. You see, even if if I told someone you only have to worry about papers and grants, they still may not believe it. They wouldn't me. believe it. Well, because I think there are a lot of, there are people who who get advice that say, yes, that say it's not just about papers and grants. It's also about, you know, networking. It's also about uh, serving on committees. It's also about, you know, being a good member of the, of the profession. Right. I mean, I've heard that advice many right. times. And, and I'm not saying that those things are irrelevant and you should, just to be that's clear. What, but that's what your mentor was saying. He said that the currency of being promoted is these two things. And, yeah, right. And I think that's a. It's, but I don't think everyone says that. Right. Like even at that level, you know, I think there are people's understandings of what it takes is different. Right. So, um, but nevertheless, I think it's basically that is true. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that is it. Right. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, for example, one one thing that's different for us than it is for you guys is that you know I think a thing that does count for us is you know, having. Uh, students um that you've graduated right but uh uh but but yeah so but other than that i think a lot of the stuff that is kind of that you get pressured to do that is kind of natural that's traditionally considered prestigious um is, may not be in your best interest may not be yeah exactly right, right. right. and i think and, and i think there's something that's that that is a critical word there is that some things may truly be prestigious. I mean, you can never say that, that everyone views them as prestigious, but you could have a general sense that there's a belief that, you know, if you have independent NIH funding, you know, for a period of X years in a row, that that person is, you know, a really good scientist, Mm -hmm. right? So maybe many people would agree with that. And so that has some sort of badass factor Mm -hmm. associated with it. But there's some things that I think are more clearly not prestigious, Mm -hmm. but there may be a perception that they're prestigious, and those can be tricky. So being the director of a training program, a fellowship training program in the School of Medicine, I think may be perceived to be more prestigious than it really is. And so maybe some of these things that you're talking about, it's not just that it, it's the perception of the of the prestige, and so having a perception of prestige helps out the institution because yeah. then there are people who want to do the job. Yeah. But 
but maybe the there's a greater disconnect between actual prestige and perceived prestige for some of these opportunities yeah. you know than other opportunities yeah i think one issue that's embedded in all of this is um is the need i think the desire for people to have um kind of standardized metrics for evaluating people right you know so for example like you and i are not in the same field but if you're the director of a training program and i'm the director of a training program then i know what that means Right, so I know. Oh, she's the director of a training program. Right. She, I know she's able, or she has been through such and such right, experience. Right. You know, or you know, and so, or for or another one is like you know, I know if you have an NIH grant, I have no idea what your field is, but I know you have to be in the top ten percent to have an NIH grant. Right, and so, um, so you must be. You've met some bar. Right, and I think um, so as you as you look across fields, or even within your own field, there may be like some subfield that you don't understand. Uh, you are sometimes in need of these kind of these these so-called prestigious like awards or, or prestigious right. kind of positions uh, to help you to kind of evaluate a person if that if it ever comes to you having to evaluate right. someone. Right, and then then it, the implication is is you should aspire to the same, right? That that's the message from all of the the, the human nature need to set up metrics of what's yeah. good. Yeah, is yeah. therefore to be good, I must. Do X, Y, and Z. Yeah, you, yeah, yes, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. I must achieve those metrics. It reverses it's, the kind of causal, yeah, causation. Exactly. Yeah, There's yeah. a bidirectional arrow yeah. there. <laughs> this is the problem when you have like a podcast with a biostatistician. <laughs> yeah. It always comes down to some causal inference, right? Right. Yeah. right. So, um, and so there are often struggles with people mid career, I think, where they love the academic environment and they love teaching and there's scholarly work that they do that's meaningful, but there's it's not. Um, valued by the institution because of processes of promotions and this traditional metric of whether people are successful or not. And it can feel very uncomfortable to say, well, I'm going to make the leap, you know, to being kind of a lead educator of the medical students Mm -hmm. or something like that. And I'm going to apply for this role in the dean's office or take on curriculum development for the medical students or for a graduate school over here. And um, so I think that there are pressures on people, even at mid-career, that may make it hard for them to pursue something that they're really good at and they enjoy right. because the culture is is that that is less valued because of just how the system, because of history and how yeah. the system is set up. Yeah. So have you ever sort of found yourself or realized retrospectively, gosh, I think I did that because I thought that that was the prestigious thing to do? Uh, or like, if you yourself ever have there ever been moments where you thought, "Gosh, I could never take a job at X institution or whatever because it's not, you know, not as prestigious as Hopkins." Or <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm just throwing out yeah. examples, but where you have felt yourself influenced by this kind of culture and and these kind of uh, arbitrary metrics of of what it means to be exceptional and you, you know in academia um that's a good yeah because you don't so you don't have a big lab quote no unquote, i do not right yes you um have had nih funding but you're not like you don't have a burning desire to think oh my gosh i i need to have constant nih grant funding and so i'm just gonna start writing grants every cycle to get a new ro1 no i don't have that right yes. so you're not worried about yeah so so you seem to have like escaped a lot of the trappings of I was the director of a training program okay but that's <laughs> fake prestige no <laughs> no. Uh, no I would agree yeah. you would agree yeah. yeah and then we subsequently lost the training program so it was all my fault oh ouch yeah, <laughs> yeah I took the fall for that one but you um, didn't become the director of the training program because you thought no I kind of fell that into that it was prestigious yeah. it was sort of right yeah. which happens oftentimes yeah but. And, um, but um, no, that was no. So that was I didn't take that because I thought, well, I should do it because it's prestigious. Right. But uh, no, I haven't had. I mean, a part of inherent in this question is kind of is that like you're kind of being offered opportunities to do things that are presumably prestigious. But some of them um, are not like even being offered. It's like this internal part of it is what drives you internally, right? So right. if you think there are some people who say, I you know I need. We talked about this in an earlier episode. Having more and more grant money coming in is much better for me. So I'm going to write a bunch of grants. Like, right. you don't seem to have 
Like it doesn't. So there may be external well, uh, people offering yeah. things, but you yourself, your own personal inside metric does not set of metrics doesn't seem to have been influenced a whole lot by the external environmental set of metrics about what success is. Or well, I, I think the place where one place where this for sure has come up many times is where to publish papers, right? I mean, I think, um, and that's like it's not exactly the same thing, but we're talking in terms of like. The kind of like the roles that you take or the jobs that you do, but um, it is something. It's the same idea. Some paper journals are just you know more prestigious. Well, I have seen people like look at impact factors and say, oh, the impact factor here is five point four, but it's only five point one at this other journal. Right. So we'll I, go I with five point four. That's right? ridiculous. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I, you know, I, I think I probably have that conversation or have that thought process way more often than I should. Uh huh. Um, that surprises me. Yeah. You, you, you seem completely kind of buffered <laughs> from, you know, those kind of external trappings. And it's, I, and I, think I for the most part I am. And but how, that and why aspect, is that? I don't know. How like, have you become buffered from that? Because I think that's unusual in academia. Yes. Right? Because you're embedded in an environment mm-hmm. that that's, it's, it, the, the, that's the institution's goal. Yeah. People are asking you about how many papers or their press releases we can put out. You have to write progress reports for yeah. your grants and et cetera, et cetera. Your boss needs to go to the dean to say, look how many millions of grant funding you know that yeah. we brought in. So all the messages you're inundated with yeah. are tied to this external rubric or you know benchmarks of what what's su- highly successful or prestigious. Yeah. And you somehow have, <laughs> don't like, care. <laughs> Well, I'll say, I guess one general comment I could say is that I feel like I am fortunate, very fortunate, to be in an environment that is on reasonably sound financial footing. <laughs> we'll put it that way. Uh, and I think that relieves quite a bit of pressure mm-hmm. um, from the faculty in general. And I think um, because you don't, we don't have to hustle for every dollar. Um, and so, so that's obviously not something that goes forever, but it's the way it is now, and I think we're fortunate to be in that situation. Right, but that's about but, money. But there's well, a lot of it about... is about money, though. Yeah, you, but yeah, I agree. But there's other stuff. Right. Um, and um, and I think I think I have done a reasonable job of kind of focusing on just doing research. And is to, that and, and and fortunately, I'm in a position that doesn't. I'm in a field, I should say, that does not require a ton of research uh, resources. Right. You know, to do the work. Right. Um, so I you mean, you just need a calculator. <laughs> yeah, a really big calculator. A big calculator. Yeah. Um, so I that so that I might have just gotten lucky. That's <laughs> but so do you think that that's an innate personality characteristic or like do, yeah, you, I, do you talk to your trainees about this? Like, do you think it's something that you can kind of promote that they start to think in a way? in terms of like, well, what are their own values and what's important to them and why did they pursue this in the first place? And, you know, there's some stuff you have to understand that's important just to, you know, get promoted in academia. But there are other things that, you know, are not, you know, you may perceive that they're prestigious, but if you spend your entire time worrying about that and not figuring out what you really like doing, Mm -hmm. you're you're not happy or satisfied in the long term, right? Yeah. So how do you... It's either an entirely an innate characteristic, and you can't do anything or help students or trainees or postdocs with that. Right. Or, and my guess is, it's probably an innate personality characteristic of yours. Like you're like an easygoing kind of person, right? <laughs> yeah, it is true. I think. Right, right. Um, I think though, it's worth reminding people on a periodic basis that they should think about like what they want and what's good for them. I think it's easy to forget. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, because you know, your life's kind of busy and it's very hectic and there's a lot of urgent things that need to be done. And um, I think it's easy to get wrapped up in kind of what other people need. Right. I think so. I, I, so I, in that sense, I think it's not like you can just like turn a switch and makes a person a different person. But on the other hand, I think it doesn't help. It doesn't hurt to um, to just kind of remind them that like think about take a minute to think about like what it is that you actually want. Right. Right. Um, because and whether this thing, this decision you made, like what's whether this thing is actually going to help you do that. Uh, because um, it's something it's just easily forgotten, I think. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. People, you you miss the big picture of, you know, what it was that motivated yep, you to. Exactly. Why did you get into this business in, in, the, in know, the first place? With, yeah. Right. All right. So I think that's it for episode 10. Yeah. And we'll see you next week. Yeah. Thanks for listening.